Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. Well, welcome to another show of Kidney Talk. Today, we're going to be talking about an issue that's extremely serious. And it's the nation is actually, you know, trying to create ways to lower infection in people in all illnesses. And today, we're talking to Carrie Halloway, who's a nurse, and she's a corporate Uh, infection control at Fresenius Medical Care. So we're really delighted to have Carrie here, and welcome to the show. Thanks a lot. Well, Carrie, tell us a little bit about your background, because I I hear you have an extensive background in kidney disease. Uh, Yes, I have worked as a nephrology nurse in dialysis for 35 years, and I've worked with uh, a couple of different companies, with Fresenius, uh, and I also worked with Gambro for a few years. And in my uh, professional life, I've been a dialysis nurse. I've been an acute dialysis nurse. I've been a home therapies dialysis nurse. And then I went from that to more of a management position where I worked as the nurse manager, clinical manager over, over uh, multiple facilities, and then as a area manager. And most recently, which was in... 2000, I moved into a corporate role working as a what we call in Fresenius, a clinical quality manager, uh, and my specialty is infection control, prevention, and surveillance. In addition, I have a personal background with dialysis as my husband was uh, a dialysis patient and was transplanted, and he had his transplant for about 25 years, and then oh, wow. he lost that kidney not to rejection, just to an, a reoccurrence of disease. And two years ago, he received a second transplant uh, at, and his was the paired transplant program. Okay, the paired donation. Okay. Yeah, my son donated to somebody and somebody donated, which was a wonderful experience. We went through the San Antonio program here in Texas. So, And then I have some other family history brothers that have been on dialysis. So I have a, a pretty good knowledge base of you're a kidney expert you know infection from all angles unfortunately (laughs) (laughs) Um, so tell us a little bit about you know I think we're really going to focus there's a lot of ways to get an infection but we're going to talk about the dialysis unit today and so um, maybe you could take the audience through when you walk into a dialysis facility as a patient and then all the way to leaving the facility what are the things that they need to look for to prevent an infection well the most important thing about the dialysis facility and being a patient on dialysis is that you want to take extremely good care of that access you have whether it's a fistula or a graft and for those patients that have uh, the central vascular catheters take extremely good care and the best care you can do is good hand washing, hand hygiene, and making sure your access is clean every time you come into that dialysis clinic. The first thing you do is you walk to the scale and weigh and then step over to the sink and scrub your access arm or leg. Don't, don't go any further until you've washed that access with soap and water because that's where the biggest risk for a dialysis patient to get an infection is from that access. For patients that have uh, the catheters, our, the thing that we want and the way to prevent infections with those are to get that catheter out as soon as possible. We all hear the stories about patients that have catheters and they don't want to be stuck with the needles because the needles hurt, uh, but... You, what The stories you don't hear are the stories of the patients that have catheters and then for some reason get some type of a catheter infection and end up in the hospital for multiple days on multiple drugs and have to come back to the clinic. And then when they come back to the clinic because they've been in the hospital, they don't feel well, they've lost weight, they're on antibiotics, and it's just a struggle for them to get back to that baseline. So for patients with catheters... Our number one thing is to get those catheters out and get a fistula placed, if possible, and if not a fistula, to get a graft put in. 
Well, you know, the thing is, is that when you have a catheter, when you have an infection that goes into your central vein, um, you know, you often become septic. Right. And that's, a, when you become septic, you have a very high risk of, of death. Um, and I think that's one of the things that some people just don't understand. It's it's playing a, a little bit of Russian roulette. Because that catheter is going right into a blood vessel and right to your heart. Right, right into the right atrium. Huh? The bacteria are crawling down that catheter. I know. And there's bacteria, you know, I think people don't realize, like, we're covered in bacteria. I mean, we have good and bad, bad bacteria, but in the dialysis unit, um, there's different types of bacteria that float around that may not be at your home. So, um, when different bacteria are in the area, they're more you're more susceptible to them if you're if you have a low immune system. And all dialysis patients have a less than optimal immune system. Right. You know, they're they're all going to be at risk for some type of infection. So, you know, the the more you can prevent having catheters, which are a big infection risk, the better off you're going to be. So I walk into the dialysis unit, and what do I need to make sure that the staff is doing? Because I've had situations where a nurse hasn't worn a mask, and I'm like, can you just please put a mask on? And they're like, oh, okay, I forgot. And I think, you know, we need to, everybody forgets things. And so what should the patients be looking for when they walk in so that they can remind the staff in a nice way that, you know, can you please wipe off my chair? Or have you seen something on the chair? Um, give us a little bit of uh, information on that. Right. You know, as a patient coming into the clinic, you know, the next thing is when you go to your chair, you want to you want to make sure that that chair has been cleaned and that the machine is clean. And you want to make sure the staff are aware of what's going on around. And there's nothing wrong with a patient saying, you know, I noticed that chair just got a half of a wipe. Would you re-wipe that chair down? We get busy as staff, and we think we've done what we were supposed to do, but other things are happening, and we may have started wiping a chair down and had to step away and done something else. So just be sure that the machine is clean, that there's no uh, supplies from the previous patient left on that machine before, you know, you sit down. And if you want to make sure the chair has been clean, you don't want to sit down in a chair that... Maybe on the side table they've left some tape or some of uh, the blue linen protectors laying from the previous patient. Uh, just make sure everything that is at the station is new and is being used on you and hasn't been used on somebody else. And especially the remote control. I mean, the remote control is a huge thing. That needs to be wiped down between every treatment because your hands are the dirtiest place on your body. <laughs> You know, we want to make sure the remote controls are wiped down for those facilities that have the the single TVs that are, like, up in the ceiling or hanging mm-hmm. from the ceiling. And even for those facilities that have the TVs on the swing arm that just is, swings right in front of the patient, we want to make sure those TVs are wiped down and the arms are wiped down, too, that the TV is on. You don't want to be using somebody else's earplug. If somebody's left an earplug in the TV, ask that staff member to remove that earplug so that you can use yours. Use yes, because it's it's you know this is how bacteria is transferred. And then when the when the staff come to uh, start your treatment, you know you want to make sure that they've washed their hands. And the the CDC studies show that the alcohol based hand hygiene that is available is better than the soap and water because people are more likely to use the alcohol-based hand hygiene where with soap and water you see people run their hands under the water and put a little soap and then kind of rinse it off. So when they come to your station to initiate your treatment, make sure that they've performed some type of hand hygiene, that the gloves that they're wearing are the gloves that they have just put on, that they haven't gone to another patient, they haven't gone to another sink and picked up something, that they put those gloves on in front of you to cannulate your access or to set up your machine, whatever they're going to do with me as a patient, I want to be sure those are clean gloves. Because um, if they're approaching you, they put the gloves on, and then the person next to you machine alarms, and then they go turn off that alarm, do they need to change their gloves? They need to take those gloves off, perform hand hygiene using the alcohol-based gel, and put a new pair of gloves on. Every time they change gloves, they should use 
that alcohol-based hand hygiene gel again. No, I mean, you know, I think a lot of times people do get busy and, you know, maybe they're like, well, I can use five machines with five different fingers. That doesn't work, huh? <laughs> Not good. And we don't, want, we don't want you to see staff out there and wrapping a glove around their finger. I know, I'm just... punching <laughs> a button. <laughs> that doesn't count. That's not wearing a club. <laughs> I, I know. I mean, you know, you, and also it's each patient has a blood pressure cuff. So um, the unit that I was in, they use disposable blood pressure cuffs. Do most facility use those? No, we don't see a lot of facilities using those yet. The, you know, uh, mainly, I guess, because it's not, in, you know, in hospitals, they're checked out to a patient. Right. And they're typically a different type of cuff than what we use and because the machines are made different you know you have to have the correct connection what some facilities are looking at and uh, providers are looking at is it's kind of a sleeve okay that you can put up over that cuff and then you take that cuff that sleeve off and throw it away okay well yeah that makes you need to wipe down that cuff okay that's a good point still want to wipe the cuff and the tubing off well one thing that i do is i always carry a gel with me in my purse. So when I was on dialysis and I was sitting there and I would, you know, I I would get out the gel and I would make sure that my hands were washed after I'm moving all over and doing different things just to make sure because you know, you bring your own blanket in and I mean, I guess you're supposed to wash your blanket between every treatment, but in reality that doesn't happen. And so um so you have to, you know, be aware that what germs you're bringing as an individual. You know, that still goes back to the whole washing your access. Right. Patients don't like to, they, they've, they've showered or bathed at home, and so when they come in, well, I, I took a bath at home. But you were on the, the transportation, you were in the car, you stopped at McDonald's or whatever, you still want to clean those germs off that you picked up between here and there. Right, exactly. So, and it's a good idea for patients to have those small vials of, or bottles of hand at their station with them because, again, you're reaching down on the floor to pick up your purse or you're touching the TV, and when it comes time to hold your uh, needle sites, you want to have hands that are clean and you want to put on gloves that are clean to hold those sites. Now, tell us a little bit about the vaccinations. Oh, I can tell you lots about vaccinations. Because, yeah, it's so important to be vaccinated. So can you maybe run through... A, a few of them, because I, I think people, I mean, the flu shot, of course, I mean, I just got a flu shot, but when you're in a dialysis unit and you don't get vaccinated, you're in a room with a bunch of people and it's, it's, you're more likely to get sick because you're in a crowd. You know, there's three vaccinations that we uh, encourage and really, really press for our patients to get. The, the most important one is the flu vaccine. Uh, the flu vaccine changes every year. The flu season can be strong one year or weak one year. And the CDC recommends the flu that people from the six months up be vaccinated from the flu. That includes patients, their family members, the health care workers. The patients on dialysis are at a higher risk to get pneumonia mm-hmm. if they don't take the flu and then they contract the flu. So it's important that all of our patients be vaccinated with influenza vaccine. And we offer that vaccine from the minute it comes into our facilities. And this year, we started receiving it in our facilities in August, all the way through April. So if you don't take it in November or December and then think, oh, well, everybody in my household is getting sick, I better take it, then you need to take it when, you, you know, when it comes to you. And some people complain that they took the vaccine and then they got the flu. Well, what really probably happened is you were already exposed, and when you got the vaccine, you got a milder case of of the flu because it can't stop it if you've already been exposed to it. I got you. The other vaccines that we encourage our patients to take are the hepatitis B vaccine because there is a risk of acquiring hepatitis B if you're a dialysis patient. We follow stringent Uh, dialysis precautions, including washing hands, wearing appropriate personal protective equipment, such as the gloves, the mask, the shields, the gown. We isolate those patients who have hepatitis B, and we put patients that have been vaccinated and are immune to hepatitis B around those patients so that we don't uh, accidentally 
expose somebody to the hepatitis B virus. But in actuality, our dialysis patients are in and out of the hospital frequently, and the risk of getting hepatitis could be in the hospital because they're having to dialyze in a, in a hospital dialysis. So to protect the, uh, the patients, we highly encourage that they take that hepatitis B vaccination. And it's administered in three or four shots, depending on which vaccine you're taking. Then you will have a test to see if you've gotten the antibodies from the vaccine. And if you've gotten antibodies, then all we do is monitor on a, an annual basis. You can potentially lose some of that protection from the vaccine. And if you do, we just offer you another vaccination. And that's so important because hepatitis B can ruin your day, can it? Yes. <laughs> and then the other vaccine that we encourage our patients to take is the pneumonia vaccine, which uh, that's you know, just as important to our patients as the influenza vaccine and uh, to protect you against certain strains of pneumonia. All of these vaccines are offered in the dialysis facility. If you choose to get the vaccine at, a, at like, the Primacare or the CVS pharmacy, that's fine. Just be sure you let your nurse at the dialysis center know that you've taken the vaccine. Well, I'm happy to report I've had all my vaccines. <laughs> Now, tell us a little bit about, because one of the things that when I was on in-center hemodialysis, it really frustrated me because I would come in and the patient next to me would be sicker than a dog and coughing and sneezing. And so I would ask for a mask because I, you know, I didn't want to get sick. I mean, obviously there's a bacterial infection and then there's a viral infection. And when somebody has a cold or if a staff member, you know, is sniffling and coughing, um, I would just take it upon myself to wear a mask. But can you give a little insight on, you know, what you would do? And um, Because it is. it's You have to go to dialysis. You know, you have to go to dialysis, and it's the same thing as when you're walking into a physician's office, especially in the, se- the flu season. You'll see in a lot of physician offices, they'll ask the, those that have those flu symptoms to sit on one side of the office and then those that are not on the other side of the office. Unfortunately, we can't really segregate our patients out that well because uh, patients are used to having the same chair, you know, based on the times they come in and things like that. So if a patient comes in with signs or symptoms of the flu, we would ask that they let their nurse know, and many times we'll ask the patients to put a mask on. The other thing is that we want to be sure that they use the alcohol-based hand gels because that's just an avenue for them to spread more germs to themselves, to their family members, to whoever they may, may meet out in the public. Uh, to always have clinics available for them, whether it's in the lobby and they can pick up a box or if you ask the staff to get you some clinics, and then be sure that, that patients know to throw those use Kleenex into the household trash. Well, and if you come in and you're well and you see a staff member that is walking around with the red nose, runny eyes, and clearly looks ill, then as a patient, you should say, you know, I really am trying to stay well. I would appreciate if you could put a mask on. And a staff member should not be offended by putting a mask on. Right. You know, we encourage our staff members to all take the vaccine because we don't want them ill, and we don't want them to get our patients ill. And if they are ill, we also encourage that they stay home, especially if they're running a fever. Yeah, when you're a fever, you're most contagious, correct? Right, right. and we don't need a sick staff member coming giving patients an illness and on top of the four or five other staff members that they may make <laughs> ill, and then we have a plague going on in our clinics. Now, you know, uh, to wrap up a little bit, I want to explain the difference to patients about a bacterial infection and a virus infection. And the reason being is because people see they're sick and they're like, I need an antibiotic. And if it's a viral infection and, you know, an antibiotic's not going to help. And and then you become resistant. So can you just touch on that a little bit? Well, what we've seen is that uh, with the overuse of antibiotics and You know, where we see it a lot is people come in, they have a cough, they think they need an antibiotic, they have a runny nose, they think they need an antibiotic. Uh, You need to be sure that it is a bacterial infection. That's what the antibiotic is going to battle, is the bacteria. A virus has to run its course. And what has happened is that 
because we've used antibiotics for all these little viral infections or allergy things that go on that people think they have a cold, we've come up with some resistant bugs, if you may, that the, the penicillin that we used to use a long time ago that would clear up the strep throat isn't going to work anymore. You know, we have to use stronger and stronger antibiotics. And what that does is that it just makes those bacteria stronger and stronger, and we have to keep looking for more uh, antibiotics, which then the, the flip side of that stronger antibiotic is, while it may make you better, sometimes the side effects make you wish you hadn't have taken them. Right. It causes diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, things like that. We only really want to treat true bacterial infections with antibiotics. Well, and I learned, too, that there's certain antibiotics that treat a wide range of, of bugs, and then there's certain antibiotics that target specific bugs. And I'm learning that it's really important to try to get the specific antibiotic for the bacteria you have because then, you you know, you don't leave yourself getting antibiotics so often that you you can't, you know, that antibiotic doesn't help you anymore. And, um, you know, I, I, it's... It's great that a lot of attention is being put on this subject because, you know, we're running out of bugs. There's some super bugs going around, and we've heard about MRSA, which is, um, I don't even know how to say that, but... methicillin resistant Staph aureus. <laughs> Thank you. I, 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 it's just a mouthful. But MRSA is extremely rampant in hospitals. So, you know, patients need to apply all of this in, in the hospital, too. Right. And there are even more... Uh, they call them multi-drug resistant organisms that are coming into into the arena now. Uh, there's extended back beta lactamase, which you know it's kind of like the new MRSA. There, it's a strong bug that we have to use strong antibiotics for. Well, and I love this website called TED.com. I don't know if you've ever been to it, TED.com, and one of the best talks on that that uh, website is called How Bacteria Talk. And my kidney failure was caused from E. coli bacteria, so I've always been intrigued by bacteria because they're they're sneaky little suckers and they, they know how to evolve and become smarter. And this particular talk, uh, they said the next evolution in you know treating bacteria is that they've identified that when bacteria get on your body, um, it was in some animal. They get on on this animal's body. They all keep duplicating. They duplicate until they feel they have enough to overtake the host. And they see under a microscope when they decide to take over the host, they all like turn on at once. It's just like saying, oh, let's go to war. It, it's, it's a pretty fascinating talk. And they say, let's go to war. And then they attack the host. So what they're researching is how to um, jam the communication system between bacteria, bad bacteria, enhance the communication between good bacteria. And, you know, if you really think about it, bacteria is like a little war on your body. And that's the strategy we use in war. We, you know, jam the communication so the soldiers can't talk to each other. And I just find it a fascinating video. So you have to go to TED.com and and look up how bacteria talk because I'm like, wouldn't that be great if we could figure out how to communicate with the good bacteria and stop the cell phone service between the bad bacteria? I'll have to look that one up. <laughs> it's I, pretty I fun. I did it on TED, but I haven't seen that. It's a, yeah, I love that site. So to wrap up, now talking about all of this hand washing and everything, I mean, I can imagine that nurses' hands must feel like cracked skin. They may have a lot of dry skin because when you're using alcohol-based um, hand cleaner, your your skin gets dry. So, you know, you have any nice lotions that you want to recommend or what, what do you do to help with that? Well, the first thing is that it's better to get an alcohol-based gel that has some emollients in it. There's some of them that have no emollient in them that are really drying. And when you look at them, they come in the alcohol percentage in them is different. Uh, you know, you can get it anywhere from a 62 to like a 95% alcohol base in them. Well, you certainly don't want to use a 95% alcohol base. That's the one that's going to dry your hands out the most. So look for a milder uh, alcohol base in it and look for the emollient and then use a good 
lotion. You know, people go and buy the the little cheap brands of lotion that when you put them on, you really can't even tell you put a lotion on. Mm-hmm. Uh, it smells good for a couple minutes. Right, right. <laughs> you know, the one that I really like, and, and not to plug a particular one, is the Eucerin Cream. Mm-hmm. I use that. Oh, I love that one. Yeah, that's it. And Lubriderm is pretty good. I've used that. And, and Carry Lotion. The Carry Lotion they mm-hmm. used to be able to get. They used in the hospitals when I first started nursing. That's all we had was Carry Lotion. Well, and one thing that I've done when I've had like dry feet and stuff, I put Vaseline on my feet and then <laughs> Vaseline and socks. <laughs> Vaseline and socks and, you know, cures all your feet problems. That's right. (laughs) So, well, you know, we really appreciate it, Carrie, for sharing your um, information on infection control. Hopefully everybody will have an infection-free holiday and... And uh, we'll get through if we apply all these techniques and everybody is 100% diligent. And get your influenza vaccination today if you haven't gotten it. And, you know, I went to uh, CVS and got mine and, you know, my insurance paid for it. And and, and it's, you know, it took 15, 20 minutes. So go go get a sherbet because sherbet's on your list to eat and get a vaccine. That's true. Have a great day. Thanks, Lori. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.